Yes, sir. Mr. Fitzgerald, uh, you said that there was damage uh, done to all of us, uh, damage to the entire nation. Can you be any, be any more specific about what kind of damage you're talking about? Uh, the short answer is no, but I can just say this. I'm not going to comment on, on things beyond what's said in the indictment. I can say that for the people who work at the CIA and work at other places, they have to expect that when they do their jobs, that classified information will be protected. They have to expect that when they do their jobs, that information about whether or not they're affiliated with the CIA will be protected. And they run a risk when they work for the CIA that something bad could happen to them. But they have to make sure that they don't run the risk that something bad is going to happen to them for something done by their own fellow government employees. But getting into the specifics of the, of the damage, I won't. But I do owe Carol the next question. You mentioned the importance to you of grand jury secrecy, and you have been leak free. But I want to know what your thoughts are about a series of leaks about your investigation. How, what was your interpretation of what some people have described as um, manipulative, selective leaking about your investigation by people close to your witnesses? And all I can say is, I, well, I'll just say this. I'm not going to comment on, on why certain things were leaked or any speculation I might have where it was leaked from. I think the average person does not understand that the rule of grand jury secrecy binds the prosecutors in the grand jury, it binds the, the um, agents who come across the grand jury information, it binds the grand jurors. Any one of us could go to jail if we leak that information. It does not bind witnesses. Witnesses can decide to tell their testimony or not. So if this were a bank robbery and we put a witness in the grand jury about the bank robbery, I would go to jail, he would go to jail, and the grand jurors would go to jail if they walked out and told you about it. But the person who went into the grand jury could walk out and hold a press conference on the front steps. So they're not breaking the law by discussing their grand jury information. I would prefer for the integrity of the investigation to not be discussed. So, but I just think people may not understand that certain people are not restricted in talking about grand jury information, and certain are. All I can do is, is make sure that myself and everyone on our team uh, follows those rules. Yes, sir. Mr. Fitzgerald, you said that uh, it was OK for government officials to be discussing among themselves uh, Mrs. Wilson's identity. Were you troubled, though, that at least a half dozen people outside the CIA seem to be talking about this in the weeks before her name was disclosed? I, I, my job is to investigate whether or not a crime is committed, can be proved, and should be charged. I'm not going to comment on, on what to make beyond that. And there's, you know, it's not, it's not, my, uh, not my jurisdiction, not my job, not my judgment. Yes, ma'am. I know you just talked about having sand in your eyes and we have the obstruction charge here. Can you give us any sense of how you think you might, how long it might take you now to determine if there was this underlying crime that occurred dealing with the unauthorized, event, unauthorized disclosure? Uh, I can't and I wouldn't. And if I had predicted, you know, two years ago when it started, when we'd be done, I would have been done a year ago. So I, I, I'm not, I'm going to, all I can tell you is as soon as we can get it done, we will. Yes, sir. Okay, you, you identified Mr. Fleischer as one of the people that uh, Mr. Libby spoke with. Could you say who the counsel to the VP was and also the Undersecretary of State that he spoke with? Um, we, we've, ident we've referred to people by their titles in the indictment just because that's our practice. We don't allege they did anything wrong, but uh, we said White House Press Secretary and we talked about counsel for the Vice President and I generally don't identify people beyond the indictment and I'll talk to Randy Sanborn who tells me what I'm allowed to do at the break. If we can provide you those names, we will. I'm not so sure we can, so we better not do it in front of our microphone. Let me just go over here. In the end, was it worth keeping Judy Miller in jail for 85 days in this case? And if you say how important her testimony was uh, in producing this indictment. Let me just say this. No one wanted to have a dispute uh, with the New York Times or anyone else. We can't talk generally about witnesses. There's much said in the public record. I would have wished nothing better that when the subpoenas were issued in August 2004, witnesses testified then and we would have been here in, in October 2004 instead of October 2005. No one would have went to jail. I didn't have a vested interest in litigating it. I was not looking for a First Amendment showdown. I also had to say my, my job was to find out what happened here, make reasoned judgments about what tes testimony was necessary, and then pursue it. And we couldn't walk away from that. I could have not have told you a year ago that we think that there may be evidence that a crime is being committed here, obstruction, that there may be a crime behind it. I'm just going to walk away from it. And our job was to find the information responsibly. We then, when we issued the subpoenas, we thought long and hard before we did that. And I can tell you there's a lot of reporters whose reporting and contacts have touched upon this case that we never even talked to. We didn't bluff people. And what we decided to do was to make sure before we subpoenaed any reporter that we really needed that testimony. In addition to that, we scrubbed it thoroughly within ourselves 
when we also, when we went to court, we could have taken the position that it's our decision whether to issue a subpoena, but we made sure that we put a detailed, classified, sealed filing before the district court judge, the chief judge, uh, Hogan in the District of Columbia. So we wanted to make sure that if he thought our efforts were off base, if what we were saying, uh, representing to him uh, was the case, was off, that he would have those facts when he made the decision. Judge Hogan agreed and felt that we met whatever standard there might be uh, for issuing a subpoena. That went, then went up to the District of Columbia Court of Appeals with that same filing, and they found uh, the, the same results, and it went to the Supreme Court. So I think what we did in seeking that testimony what was borne out by how the judges ruled. At the end of the day, I don't know how you could ever resolve this case, to walk into you a year ago and say, you know what, forget the reporters, we have someone telling us that they told Mr. Cooper and Ms. Miller that they didn't know if this information were true. They just heard it from other reporters, they didn't know if he had a wife, and charge a person with perjury, only to find out that's what happened. That would be reckless. Uh, on the other hand, um, if we walked away and said, well, there are indications that, in fact, this is not how the conversation would happen. There are indications that there might be perjury or obstruction of justice here. I'm going to fold up my tent and go home. That would not uh, fulfill our mandate. I tell you, I will say this, I do not think that reporters should be subpoenaed anything close to routinely. It should be an extraordinary case. But if you're dealing with a crime, and what's different here is the transaction is between a person and a reporter, they're the eyewitness to the crime, if you walk away from that and don't talk to the eyewitness, you are doing a reckless job of either charging someone with a crime that may not turn out to have be, been committed. And that frightens me, because there are things that you can learn from a reporter that would show you that the crime wasn't committed. What if, in fact, you know, the allegations turned out to be true that he said, hey, I sourced it to other reporters. I don't know if it's true. So I think the only way you can do an investigation like this is to hear from all the witnesses. I wish Ms. Miller spent not a second in jail. I wish we didn't have to spend time uh, arguing very, very important issues and just got down to the brass tacks and made the call of where we were. But I think it had to be done. Yes, sir. Uh, uh, you said earlier in your statement here that Mr. Libby was the first person to leak this information outside of the government. That, first of all, that implies that there might have been other people inside the government who made such leaks. Secondly, in paragraph 21, the one about official A, uh, you implied that Novak might have heard this information about the woman, uh, Mrs. Wilson, from another source, but you don't actually say that. What can you tell us about the existence that you know of or don't know of or whatever of other leakers? Are there definitely other leakers? Is Ms. Official A a, a leaker or just a, a facilitator? Uh, are you continuing to investigate other, other possible leakers? Okay. I, I'm afraid I'm, I'm going to have to find a, a polite way of repeating my answer to Mr. Isikoff's question, which is to simply say, I can't go beyond the four corners of the indictment, and I'll probably just say I repeat it so I don't misstep and give you anything more than I should. Yes. Can you say whether or not you know whether Mr. Libby knew that Valerie Wilson's identity was covert, and whether or not that was pivotal, pivotal at all in your inability or your, your decision not to charge under the Intelligence Identity Protection Act? Let me say two things. Number one, I am not speaking to whether or not Valerie Wilson was covert, and anything I say is not intended to say anything beyond this, that she was a CIA officer uh, from January 1st, 2002 forward. I will confirm that her association with the CIA was classified uh, at that time through July 2003. And all I'll say is that, look, we have not made any allegation that Mr. Libby knowingly, intentionally um, outed a covert agent. We have not charged that. And so I'm not making that assertion. Yes, sir. Would you oppose a congressional investigation into the leak of Valerie Flame's identity? And if not, would you be willing to cooperate with such an investigation by handing over the work products of your investigation? Well, that, I guess that's two questions, and I'm not sure. I know I can answer the first. Can't, I can answer the, the, the second part. Turning over the work product, there are strict rules about grand jury secrecy if there were an investigation. And frankly, I have to pull the book out and get the, the people smarter than me about grand jury rules in Chicago and sit down and tell me how it works. My gut instinct is that we do not, um, uh, very, very rarely is grand jury information shared with, uh, 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 the c with the Congress. And I also think I have to be careful about what my charter is here. I don't think it's my, my role to opine on whether the Justice Department uh, would oppose or not oppose uh, some other investigation. So I'm, I'm certainly not going to figure that out standing up here with 
a bunch of cameras pointed at me.